kind of, I'm, I'm kind of famous in my family for being technologically um, a challenge, like the time I paid $83 for the Kenmore man to come fix our washing machine. The guy was great. He was brilliant. He did it in about 30 seconds. He came back up and he said, Mr. Bratrude, you have to shut the lid. That's all it was. I, I had gone back down and thrown a pair of socks in and forgot to shut the lid, thought the thing had broken because it didn't drain the water. Well, I paid him $83 to find out I have to shut the lid for the washing machine to work. Maybe there's a few others in this room that are finding out that as the technology advances, you don't, and as the technology advances, you become even more technologically challenged. I appreciate the uh, uh, laptop computer the church provided me, and I appreciate the tutoring that Mark has given me, and I have to admit, it has tried my patience. And uh, not long ago, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, I was working on a document, and. And I only had a window of time. I had two hours to put into it. I needed to get it done. And uh, it got to that place where after about an hour or so, it froze up on me. Now, can you blame me for being frustrated? I, I'm, I'm under a time limit, and it froze up on me. And the most frustrating thing of all was, you know how you, you got, I had a wireless mouse. Everything's wireless now. I had a wireless mouse. You all know what a mouse is when you're talking about computers. But I had one of those. I had a wireless mouse. And, and, I, and I, got, I got so frustrated because I'd been working on this document. I'd been making some changes. I had to get it in. I had to send it out. And, and, and all of a sudden, I couldn't move. You know the little arrow? Every time I moved the mouse, the arrow wouldn't go anywhere. It just stayed there. And, and, and I tried to get it on one of those little picture things so that I could open something up. And then, now that, well, maybe I just closed the whole thing down. I couldn't shut it off. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go anywhere. And, I, and the longer I tried, minutes were going by. I only had a little bit of time to get this done. And I'm getting really frustrated. And then the thought came to me, I need to throw something. I, it's just one of those moments that the frustration is there. It's like the boiling of, a, of, of, of water. You know, you got to let off some steam. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I need to th throw. Something at this moment deserves to be thrown. And I was going to throw that wireless mouse. And I thought, it's wireless. It's not going to break anything else. So just, I'll just throw it. And then, and then I thought, no, you shouldn't do that. I mean, I'm a Christian. And somebody might find out that I threw it. What if I break it? And I actually had it up in the air like this. And I'm thinking, I, I'm going to throw it. I don't know how it knew. But it made a noise at me. And I, I just, I, it startled me. I thought, Wait, how did it, you know, like the GPA thing, you're driving down the road and it keeps talking to you? Keeps saying, that, you know, 500 feet, make a U-turn? Because you missed where you're supposed to turn. I hate that lady's voice. But I, I've, got, I've, got my, I've got it up in the air, and, I, and I'm thinking, I, 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 am I going to throw this? And just as I'm thinking that, it, 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 sent a, it made a, a noise at me. I thought, wow, how did it know? It's, it's like trying to protect itself. How did it know? And then I realized, uh, I recognize that sound. Oh, wow, somebody's sending me a text. Who's texting me? And I look, wait a minute, I don't have the mouse in my hand. For the last 20 minutes, I've been sliding my cell phone around the table. <laughs> I've been tapping on my cell phone. I was on this stupid program. Why won't it? It won't respond. It won't do anything. <laughs> I'm so glad somebody sent me a text before I threw my cell phone into the wall and then threw the computer away and said, nuts to this, I'm getting out my pencil. I'm doing it the old way. Well, how many of you know if you want the right results, you got to do the right thing? You, you don't get results on your software program by sliding. Well, maybe they make cell phones that could do this, but I don't think you can slide a cell phone and have it change your document. And you certainly can't just keep tapping on it and hoping it'll open something up. If you want the right results, you got to do the right things. And I want to talk to you today about something so basic, so simple, and yet so undone. Today we're starting a new series in the book of 1 Timothy. We'll cover 2 Timothy also, but we're kind of starting in the middle. And I know that's unorthodox, but I do have a reason for doing that. So go ahead and find chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. And, and in the weeks ahead, days ahead, if you could be reading First and 2 Timothy, I think it'll be helpful to you. I, I want to just really jump into these two books. There's so much great truth here. But the reason that I'm starting in the middle instead of the beginning will become obvious toward the end of my message. And, 
And, and, and I want to look at this one thought. Exercise yourself unto godliness. Exercise yourself unto godliness. If you want to be godly, you've got to do the right things. You don't just become godly because you want to be godly. Any more than you change a document just because you wanted it changed. You have to do the right things. And look at chapter 4, if you would. I'll read a couple verses and then continue the introduction before we really jump into this. Look at verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wise fables and exercise yourself unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Exercise yourself unto godliness. Godliness is profitable for all things. It's profitable for this life. It's profitable for the life that is to come. Recently, I read a quote, and when I first read it, I thought, man, I don't think that's right. Sounded kind of egotistical. Sounded like, wow, this guy thinks everything revolves around himself. And the guy's a really, really greatly used uh, man of God. He died in the 1800s. But Robert Murray McShane said this, he, and I quote, he said, the greatest need of my people, meaning his church, his congregation, the greatest need of my people is my personal holiness. And I thought, wait a minute, are you saying that everything revolves around you? The greatest need of your people is your personal holiness? Is, that's literally what he was saying. And then I got to pondering that. What could be more important? And I believe the greatest need of the church is for godly men. I believe the greatest need of our society is for godly men and women. I believe the greatest need, uh, sir, let me talk to the men for a moment. The greatest need your wife has is not for a, a larger house, it's not for a better car, it's not for a washing machine that can work with the lid up. The greatest need that your wife has is to be married to a man of God. The greatest need your children have and your grandchildren, the greatest need they have is to have men of God in their life, you being the principal one. The greatest need is to be godly. And what is missing in the church and what is missing, certainly if it's missing in the church, it's going to be missing in our culture. The greatest need is godliness. We have more technology today. We have more programs today. We have more knowledge today. We have more information today. But do we have more godliness today? The greatest need of your family is for you to be a person of God. This has happened on more than one occasion. Usually it's the man. It's happened the other way around, though, also. But a man will come to me, and he'll, he'll be in tears, and he'll be all upset. He said, my wife doesn't want to have me back. She found out I was having an affair, and I know I was wrong. And, and what do I do? I want her back. I want my family back together. And I said, look, there's one thing you have to do. Oh, we talk about repentance and, and, and all kinds of things. But, you know, if you're going to put that thing back together, you've got to learn to trust you again. And, and the most important thing you can do, the one thing you are in control of, be a man of God. From this day forth, you become a man of God. She needs to see a man of God. She needs to see you becoming that. But you know what? Very few actually follow through on that because it takes time. We as men in particular, we want instant results, don't we? We want to fix it right now. We might have spent years messing it up, but we expect it to be fixed right now. And there are some things that are only fixed as we become men of God, as we become women of God, as we become godly. And so today, I, I want to look at this whole thought. Just, it's very simple. It's very basic. But oh, how essential it is that we learn how to exercise ourselves unto godliness. Well, we need to start by answering this very simple question. What is godliness? Well, let's look at the word. The word that is used, and it's used often in the book of Timothy. We'll look at those places in, the, in, in a moment. But the word is Eusebia, and Eusebia comes from two words, two little Greek words. The second one, save your mind. The first one is eus, and eus simply means to do well, to do something well. I want you to notice the two thoughts that are involved with that one simple word, to do something, but to do it well. Not just to do it, but to do it well, to do something well. That's what that first word means. And eus in the, in the New Testament is used, for example, where Jesus says, 
Uh, in Matthew, he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's the word he used. In other words, you did the right things and you did them well. And then the second part of this word that we get the word godly from, in your Bibles, it might be translated devout, devoted, devout. It might be translated uh, reverent. But the second part of that word, sabiumai, simply means to worship. It has to do with, with being devoted to worshiping. So put those two together, to worship well. What does it mean to be godly? It means to be someone who's always bent toward God. It means to be someone who is a worshiper of God, and you do it well. And by worship, we do not just mean singing of songs. That is an aspect of worship. We do not just mean raising of hands. But it has to do with living the kind of life that is pointed toward God, that is devoted toward God. It has to do with doing that well. That's what it means to be godly, to worship well. And to let worship be a part of all that we are and, and all that we do. And so those two words, to do it well and to do worship. And Vine, in his book of uh, words, uh, dictionary of, of words, New Testament words, says this. Uh, God simply means, means doing what is well-pleasing to God. That you live a life every day of your life with this one thing in mind, I want to please God. I want my actions and attitudes today to be an act of worship that I do well toward God. That's godliness. To do well and worship. Put those two together. To do what is right, to do what is good, but to do it as, as unto God. And I remember talking to a friend of mine. He was involved with a Baptist church, and they were looking for a pastor. And I, I mentioned to him, I said, well, are you having trouble getting candidates? He said, oh, there's all kinds of applications coming in. We have more applications than we know what to do with. I said, well, it ought to be easy to find them. And he said, no, because there's just very few that really fear God. I think that is the greatest need today of people who really fear God, of, what, of, of becoming godly. Why do I say fear God? Well, Look on, on the screen, we, we have some related words to our word for godly. And all of these words, theosabia and eulabia, these words all have to do with godly fear. And they're related to godliness. What is a man of God? A man of God is a man who fears God, who wants to honor God in everything he does. A man of God is someone that does not want to live one single day without honoring God. That's the fear of God. And that is uh, being godly. Look at, look at all these verses in Timothy. Timothy is a young man, and Paul is writing Timothy. We'll look at Timothy more next week and get kind of a, a sketch of who this man was. He's a fascinating study in overcoming, Timothy. But he was a young man, and he was, he was uh, commissioned into a, a ministry that probably made him feel like he was in over his head. And so Paul is writing him to encourage him, but one of the main things that Paul is constantly encouraging him in is to be godly, to be a man of God. That'll answer so many things, so many situations, if we will just be godly. But listen to these words in the, in the writings of Timothy, Paul to Timothy. 1 Timothy 2.2, 2, that we might live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. Uh, 1, Peter, uh, 1 Timothy rather, chapter 3, verse 16, the incarnation, he calls that the mystery of godliness. In chapter 6, he talks a lot about godliness, a doctrine that is in accordance with godliness. There are those that suppose godliness is a means of gain. Stay away from them. Godliness with contentment is great gain. And we are even told in verse 11 of chapter 6 to pursue godliness. What does that word pursue mean? It means to chase hard after it. Every day of our lives, God says, I want you to chase hard after godliness. Let this be a day in which you grow in godliness. That you become more a man, a woman, of God. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, it says godliness is to be shown, first of all, at home, among those who know us best, among those from whom we cannot hide. I love the definition one man gave of a successful life. He said, this is how I gauge success. And he was a very successful business person. He said, I don't gauge success based on how much money I make or how big or how influential my company becomes, but to me, success is measured by one simple evaluation. If at the end of my life, my wife admires me and my children respect me, I have lived a successful life. Think of that. 
Pretty simple. Doesn't have to do with how many sales we made or how, how much influence we had in terms of the political realm. Or it comes down to two simple realms. How does your wife see you and how do your children see you? Because they see you like no one else sees you. And if we can be godly at home, if we can be a man of God to our wives who see us every day, day in and day out, and men of God to our children and our grandchildren, then we will have lived a successful life. I don't believe this will happen because of some of the benefits of godliness, but if you end your life with zero in the bank and nobody but your wife and children have ever even heard about you, and yet your wife admires you and your children respect you, You've led a great life. But that requires godliness. So exercise yourself unto godliness. In 1 Timothy 2.10, he says that women, there's a certain way women should dress if they're professing godliness. So it's not just the men. Men, you should be godly, but women, godly too. In, in chapter uh, 3 of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verse 12, he talks about all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. In 2 Timothy 3, 5, he says there are many who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. Stay away from them. So here we have it all throughout the book. Godliness. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness is profitable for all things. Godliness is profitable for this life, and it's profitable for the life that is to come. There's many other scriptures in the New Testament that have to do with godliness. I think of 2 Peter 1. It's mentioned three times there that we are to add godliness to our faith. But it also says that God has provided everything we need for life and godliness. It's not enough to have your bills paid and shelter and and transportation and the basic things that God says, I provide that for you. No, he wants us to grow not only in our provisional needs of shelter and food and clothing, and he wants us to grow in godliness. He said, I have provided all that you need to live this life. I've, I've provided all that you need, and I've provided all that you need to live it godly. What does that tell me? That tells me that every single one of us can be godly. But we must learn how to exercise ourselves unto godliness. 2 Peter 3.11, knowing that the Lord is coming and this earth will be dissolved with a, a, a tremendous cataclysmic uh, fireball, that, that the elements will melt with fervent heat, seeing that all these things will happen. What kind of people ought you to be? He answers it in the same question, in all holy behavior and godliness. I don't know when Jesus is coming. I know there's a lot going on today about the blood red moons and different things and events in Israel's calendar. And, and I think it's exciting to look at those kind of things, but I know this is one thing you can control, whether or not you're godly. That when Jesus comes again, we need to be godly. What kind of people ought you to be? In light of the end of all things, be godly. It's the greatest need of the church. It's the greatest need of your family. It's your greatest need is that you and I will be godly. And so today, I, I, I want to just take a, a quick look at how, how, how do we become godly? Well, notice there's promises here. It says, godliness has promise unto all things. It's profitable unto all things. Godliness has promise for this life. Deuteronomy 4 is a great example. He says, if you obey my commands, if you live my way, is basically what God is saying. It'll go well with you. Not only will it go well with you, but it will go well with your children. I really want you to see that, that one of the greatest things you can do for future generations is be godly yourself. So I want to build up an inheritance for my kids. No, give them a heritage. I think it's good to give your kids an inheritance, but give them a heritage. Give them a heritage of godliness, of a tradition that says we honor God. What does it mean? I remember sitting down with my dad one day, had a great time of interviewing my dad, and I said, Dad, would you please tell me to you what does it mean to be a brat trude. I bear the name. You pass the name on to me. I'm going to pass it on to others. What does it mean to be a brat trude? And we, we had a discussion about that. And, and I felt like I had a heritage that I have to carry on. I have to pass that on. You have a heritage. And if it's not a heritage that is good, then change it and pass on a heritage of godliness. Start something new or 
If you come from a godly heritage, then keep it going. But we all have this great need to be godly. And, and, he, and he compares godliness with exercise here. But, but godliness is profitable. It has promise for this life. I just want to repeat for you uh, some, some scriptures. I'm going to say them really quickly. Uh, you can get a, a, an outline of all these scriptures after the service in the tape room. But I love these passages. I pray them often, and I, I think of them often, and I want you to claim them. It's what I simply call the seed of the righteous. Listen to these about righteous people. It says, their seed will inherit the earth, Psalm 25. Their seed will never beg for bread, Psalm 37. It's all the economy. And what are taxes going to be like? And what's it going to be like with health? I know this. My seed will never beg for bread. Didn't he say that? There is a condition, but the, the seed of the righteous will never beg for bread. The seed of the righteous will inherit and dwell in God's dwelling place, Psalm 69. The seed of the righteous, the children of the righteous will be established upon the earth and be mighty on the earth, Psalm 112. God's mercy and righteousness will be upon children and grandchildren of the righteous. Think of that, Psalm 103. That if you are righteous, God's mercy is going to be on you and on your grandchildren. That's something worth living for. Their children will withstand the enemy in the gates, Psalm 127.5. Their children will ha always have a place of refuge, Proverbs 14. That if you will live a godly life, if, if you will be one of the righteous, your children will always have a place of shelter, of refuge, no matter what happens in life. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 that if we walk in integrity, our children will be blessed after us. I know the hearts of many of us in this room. I know many of you personally. And I know uh, th th those of you that I know, I know you'd agree with me. You'd say, yes, that's what I want. What we want more than, than good things for ourselves is we want our children to be blessed. We want our grandchildren to be blessed. How can you guarantee the blessing of your children? How can you guarantee blessing on your grandchildren? One way, be godly. Be righteous so that these promises that are to the seed of the righteous will take effect. And by the way, uh, godliness is possible for all of us, and it can begin today. It won't be instant, but it can begin today. None of us are outside the realm of becoming godly because you exercise yourself unto godliness. Exercise yourself. And think of all the things. If you live a godly life, think of all the things you'll, do, you'll avoid. If a man and a woman are both godly in their marriage, think of what they'll avoid. They'll avoid all the brokenness of divorce. They'll, they'll, they'll avoid the, 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 the tragedy and the, the pain, the deep pain of betrayal and affairs and all that. If you live godly, if you live godly, you won't die of alcoholism. If you live godly, you won't go broke from gambling. If you live godly, think of all the benefits. Living godly. Godliness is profitable in this life. And it's also profitable in the life that is to come. I mean, Jesus said the righteous will shine forth like the sun, like the brilliance of the sun in the kingdom of their father. He said that in Matthew 13. If you're righteous, and we already quoted the Lord saying, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So if you're godly, it will pay off in this life, but also in the life to come. Godliness is profitable unto all things. It has promise for this life, and it has promise for the life that is to come. Well, how do I become godly? A lot of people think that Paul was adverse to exercise. And um, the reasons being is that there was asceticism in his day. Uh, there, were, there were all kinds of different uh, movements in his day, and Paul rejected many of them in favor of the gospel. Many people think that Paul was sickly himself, so he couldn't have exercised much. But you know, there's a very interesting passage. Notice he says, exercise, bodily exercise, does profit, but the profit of it is limited. I, I, I like to call Paul one of the first biblical marathoners. Look, write down this scripture, Acts 20, 13 through 14. It's easy to read, read over this and just kind of skip over it, but Acts 20, verses 13 and 14, it talks about how they're on a journey, Luke's writing it, they're on a journey to a place called Assos, A-S-S-O-S, -S -S, and to get there, there was a peninsula sticking out, and, and all the companions of Paul got on a ship and sailed around this peninsula. It was a 40-mile trip, but it says Paul met them on the other side because he went by foot. That's 25 miles. They, we know by the map, that's 25 miles. Isn't it interesting? Paul said, you guys get, go ahead and get on. You guys sail over there. I'll meet you over there. 
He did it on foot. Did he jog? Did he walk? Why did he do that? Maybe he just wanted to be alone. Maybe he wanted to think. Maybe walking and thinking and praying were something he did. Maybe he jogged. Maybe he did a little marathon there. But he was not adverse to exercise. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He said, I keep my body under discipline. Lest I don't want to have preached to others and then I myself become a castaway. He knew something about exercise. He knew something about discipline. But he says bodily exercise, there's, there's limits to it. I was reading this, uh, there's a fellow named Dean Carnazes, and he wrote a book, Ultra Marathon, Confessions of an All-Night Runner. This guy, you know a marathon is 26 point some miles? This guy runs races that are over 100 miles long. He runs one that goes through Death Valley. He writes in his book how he ran on the white stripe on the side of the road because the, the pavement was so hot he didn't want to melt his shoes. That race was 135 miles. How does he train? He runs all night, several nights a week. Wow. That's a bit much, don't you think? <laughs> and Jim Fix, many of you know the Jim Fix, he, he wrote a, a book on running that, that sold millions of copies and, and set the whole craze toward running. Chap, one of the chapters in his book was the longevity of running, how running will increase the longevity of your life. Although you probably know he fell over dead of a heart attack at the end of one of his jogs at only 52 years old. Not because of the jog, it was, you know, inherited kind of condition. But, but exercise is good. You, you and I, with our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We need to learn how to take care of our bodies. And Paul is not denying. He's just saying there's limits to the benefit of that. But there is no limit to the benefit of godliness. If you exercise yourself unto godliness, it has promise to this life, and it has promise in the life that is yet to come. Well, what, how do we get there? What, how do we become godly? He uses the word exercise. I, I won't ask you to raise hands. I, I won't ask you to incriminate yourself. But I could have said, how many of you made a New Year's resolution to exercise? And the reason I don't even bother to ask that is because I know about only about 3% of all New Year's resolutions are fulfilled anyway. But about this time of year, we get nerve enough to step on a scale, and we say, oh, I'm going to exercise. And we do it for about a few days. But how do we become godly? You got to exercise. Exercise yourself unto godliness. And this word, exercise, we get our word gym from it. That makes sense. Gymnasio, we get our word gymnasium from it. Gymnasio. But here's the interesting thing: the word gymnasio originally, in its in its base root form, the word gymnasio means to strip off your clothing, to become naked. It's the same root word that wife, the, the name wife, the, the title wife. In other words, your wife is the only one that nakedness should be involved. You don't get to see anybody else naked. You shouldn't be naked with anybody else. Our culture needs to hear that message, don't they? I mean, the very word for wife means naked. She's the only one you can be naked with. And she's the only one you should see naked. That's, what the, that's where the word comes. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I'm just giving you the word. The word gymnasio means to, to remove clothing. Why? Because in the ancient times, that's how they exercised, and they competed with very little clothing on, lest something hinder them. Now keep that in mind when you read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. We've got a race set before us that we need to run un unhindered. So he says, strip off anything that hinders you. Uses that same thought, that same word, gymnasio. Now let me ask you this. Is there, is there things in your life that, in, that are keeping you from being godly? then strip them off. You, it begins with a willingness to strip off anything that is keeping us from being godly. And sometimes the things that are keeping us from being godly are not, as, uh, in essence, sinful things in and of themselves. There might be some scheduling we don't want to change, but unless you do, you're not going to be godly. There, there might be some things that in the right context can be enjoyed by everyone, but maybe they're out of balance in your life and they need to be stripped away. If you're going to run this race with endurance that God has set before you, there might be some things that we need to strip off ourselves. We need to, in order to exercise ourselves under godliness, there might be some things we need to give up. And, and as I talk about these things, you can decide what they are and let the Lord speak to your own heart. We're not, we're not trying to be legalists here, and, and I'm really trying to be encouraging in this one simple thought. Every single one of us can become godly. Because there's certain, what, do we, what is exercise? Let's define exercise for a moment. Let me give you a real basic meaning. I know the word itself means to strip off your clothing, to become naked, but it's so that you can have unhindered movement. That's the purpose. But what is exercise? Exercise 
is something you do repeatedly to establish a lasting condition or response. Let me say that again and think about it. Now we're going to apply it spiritually. An exercise is something that you do repeatedly. Think of it in the physical realm. You do it repeatedly, and you're doing it repeatedly to bring about, to establish a lasting condition or response. So you can train yourself how to respond to certain, condi- a certain situations, and you can bring about certain conditions in your physical body Here's an exercise, you know, if you want your stomach to be flat. Many resolutions had to do with that this year. Oh, I want a flat stomach. And there's certain exercises you can do to get a flat stomach. And there's also certain exercises you can do with the elbow. You put a little weight on the end of a fork and you use your elbow and you can get a round stomach. You can do an exercise for that. It depends on what condition you want. You decide what exercise you need. Or a response. You want to condition yourself to respond a certain way. There are exercises you can do for that. Uh, Years ago, I heard Pastor Brayton give this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes, and I'll just say it again for you. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Think on that for a moment. If you take a thought and let that thought become an action... And then you repeat those actions, you sow those actions, they become a habit. And what is a character but the sum total of your habits? And what determines your destiny? What determines what life will be like for you? Your character. And so if we sow the right thoughts and we sow the right actions and we develop the right habits, we can be godly. Exercise yourself unto godliness. It's something that literally all of us can do, but like Jay Adams says, the reason very few of us actually do it is we're living in an instant society. We want instant results. I have people that come to me and say, Pastor, would you lay hands on me that I I can have a healed marriage? I say, well, I can pray for your marriage, but laying out of hands is not going to change your marriage. Certain exercises, certain things you got to do to be able to bring that about. We, we want somebody to have an anointing that somehow that anointing can fix things for us. And once in a while, God does that. But most things in life you have because you exercised unto them. And even in Peter, he talks about hearts that are exercised unto covetousness. You, you exercise yourself always wanting more, wanting, and that's what you developed. So I want to spend the balance of our time here this morning on, on just what do I need to do? What do you need to do this year? That's why I put it the first weekend of the year. That's why I jumped ahead in our study. Because many of us like the calendar. We say, okay, it's January. It's the first weekend of the year. And and I want to do something the whole year. And I want to encourage you. Let's take what we're talking about today and make up your mind. You're going to exercise yourself unto godliness. There are three areas, only one of which we're going to really talk about today. But it has three categories within it. Simply write down the word devotion. If you're going to be godly, you must exercise yourself in the area of devotion. The word devotion means to be set apart for or unto. It's like sanctification in a sense. To be devoted to something, to be committed to something. There's certain commitments you have to make. All right, what are they? Look at chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. These are going to come right out of the book. Chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. Therefore, I exhort first of all, Circle that. First of all. What does that mean? That's to be the highest priority. I exhort, therefore, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings who are and those who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. We'll do a whole separate teaching on breaking that down, but notice what he says is first of all. First of all is prayer. If you want to be godly, you must exercise yourself in prayer. There are certain things that you have to do every day if you're going to be godly. Not once in a while, every day. The inner man, according to 2 Corinthians 4.16, the inner man is to be renewed day by day. There are certain things you've got to do daily. And we say, well, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. That word disciple has in it the thought of discipline. Every day. There's exercises that I want to do every day. Write this phrase down. When, not if. When, not if. Jesus said, when you pray. And he talked about how to pray. He didn't say if you pray. 
He said when you pray. He didn't say if you fast. He said when you fast. And, and, and it's just a part of the Christian life. Prayer and seeking God, including fasting. He said when you do it. And he gave certain ways of, of doing it, certain things to keep in mind. Don't do it for show. Go into your closet. We're going to be talking a lot at the men's retreat, the Lord's Prayer. There's a model on how to pray. There are things we can learn from the Word that help us, equip us in prayer. But the bottom line is you've got to pray. I remember saying to Pastor Brayton one day when I was first starting a ministry, Pastor, tell me, how do you pray? I wanted a formula. I wanted some set pattern. And he said this, you just pray until you know you've prayed. You just pray until you know you've touched God and God's touched you. And, and, and make, that, make that a priority of your life. Here's the word devotion. Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer. In Acts 1, 14, they devoted themselves to prayer. How important is prayer in our life? We say, Lord, I want to be like Jesus. What did Jesus do? Mark chapter 1, verse 35, rising early while it was still dark, he prayed. Luke chapter 4, when people were surrounding him and crowding because of all the miracles, it said he would withdraw. It was a priority to get away, to get alone, to pray. We will never, ever be godly if we are not committed to daily prayer. The daily discipline of prayer. And I'm not teaching you how to be saved. I'm not saying, oh, to be saved, to become a Christian, to get into heaven, you've got to put this kind of rigid time in. No, this is how to be godly. How to be godly. To make prayer a priority in your life. And I felt convicted years ago reading the story of Jesus. Matthew 26, remember 40, 41? These guys fell asleep in the garden. I, that's me. I fall asleep in the garden. I've fallen asleep in prayer many times. You'll be, you'll be set aside time to pray and, 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 you pray and you fall asleep. And I've known people that say, well, I don't pray every morning because I fall asleep. Well, keep doing it. You eventually wake up. I mean, to say, I'm not even going to start praying because I might fall asleep. How defeatist is that? I mean, I don't care what, you, what props you need. You start the day, put the timer on your coffee pot. Put, time it so that there's fresh coffee before you get out of bed. Uh, even if you've got to inject it right into your vein, do it. But get up and pray. You'll never, ever, I cannot be godly, you cannot be godly, unless we are devoted to prayer. It's that simple. It's that basic. And yet, think about it. We usually omit the basics. We usually omit the basics. I had a young man come to me, and he said, Pastor, I need to talk to you because I, my feelings are all messed up, and I, I feel so condemned. I, I feel backslidden, and I just don't like feeling this way. I said, well, tell me about your prayer life. Oh, I don't really pray much. Well, what, did, what, what have you read recently in the Bible? I haven't read it for a while. Well, what are you involved with? What kind of group are you part of in the church? Or what, what are you doing in service? He said, oh, I'm, I'm just, I just don't feel like doing anything. I don't do anything. I said, there's nothing wrong with you. You feel exactly like you're supposed to feel. He said, well, I told you I feel backslidden. I said, right, you are. <laughs> but you, your, your feeling is right. Your feeling is accurate. You're feeling what you're supposed to be feeling. Why is it that we just assume that because we want to feel right, we will feel right? You know, if you do what is right, eventually you will feel what is right. Eventually. And in Genesis chapter 4, God said to Cain, why is your face fallen? Why are you so down? Why are you so depressed? If you do what is right, there will be a lifting. That's what God said. So if you do what is right, eventually, maybe not right away, but eventually you will feel what is right. So get doing what is right. Is it right to pray every day? Uh, one big uh, automobile company offered a reward to whatever employee could come up with the best uh, idea for making work, uh, more efficient work in the workplace. Offered $2,500, this was many, many years ago, that was the prize. You wanna know what won, won the prize? Some guy just took a, a sheet of paper and wrote down one sentence. Do the most important thing first. And handed it in, that won the prize. And you know what, that, that is good advice. Do the most important thing first. What is the most important thing for your life? What is it? We all know the answer. The most important thing for my life is to be connected to God. The most important thing for my life is to be in fellowship with God, to be in right relationship with God. Everything else flows out of that. So do the most important thing first. And do it at a time of day that it will not be interrupted. Do it at a time of day. You can do it every day, whatever time that is for you. But do it first. Devote yourself 
to a life of prayer. And Jesus in the garden, these guys fell asleep, and, and he said, could you do this for one hour? Couldn't you just, that was, in his mind, that was like a minimum. Couldn't you tarry with me for one hour? I was reading the biography of Hudson Taylor, tremendous missionary, first guy that we know of, maybe somebody else did it, but first guy that we know of that took the gospel to the uh, mainland China, not just to Hong Kong, but mainland China. He was a revolutionary in missions. And he wrote a, a, his, his life story, but in that, in that biography in, of, of his life, he made this statement. He said, 90% of the time when I pray, my heart feels like a block of wood. Now, that might not sound inspiring to you, but that encouraged me. Now, here's this great man of God, and he's admitting. It's not always feeling. It's just doing it. It's just saying, this is what a man of God does, so this is what I'm going to do. Because I want to be a man of God, whether I feel inspired or not, even if my, my heart feels like a block of wood, even if I'm constantly nodding off and having to wake myself, I'm going to do it. Because that's what a man of God does. I love what it says about Abraham. Abraham, in Genesis 19, 27, listen to these simple words. Remember the, how God had destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and the judgment of God came, and Lot's wife was destroyed because she looked at it, remember? But do you know that Abraham looked at it, and he wasn't destroyed? Genesis chapter 19, listen to this. Genesis 19, after the, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 27, now Abraham arose early in the morning, and went to the place where he stood before the Lord. And it goes on to tell how he turned his eyes toward Sodom and saw the burning. He wasn't destroyed. But notice he had a time and he had a place. Abraham went to the place early in the morning where he stood before the Lord. Do the most important thing first. Samuel's parents, 1 Samuel 1, 19, they rose early in the morning to worship. Jacob rose early in the morning, Genesis 28, 18, to worship. Job, I love Job. And I know people say, well, yeah, but he lost everything. Wait a minute, let's back up about Job. What did God say about Job? God said, I have nobody like him. Have you considered him? He is a man of integrity. And what did Job do? Job 1, 5, every morning, early in the morning, Job would get up and offer sacrifices on behalf of his children and his family. Man, I admire that. I admire the fact that here is a man who takes the headship of his tribe seriously, that says, I don't know how they're living, but I have to stand before God on their behalf. And I will rise early in the morning, and I will, I will stand before God for my children, on behalf of my children. And God looked at him and said, I don't have another man like you. He's a man of integrity. That challenges me. To get up every morning and to say, God, here I am, because I need you. Here I am on behalf of my wife. Here I am on behalf of my kids, my grandkids. Here I am, Lord. As unworthy as I am, as, as many times as I've blown it, Lord, I'm here again. I'm here on their behalf and, I, and my own. Abraham rose up early, and he went to the place where he stood before the Lord. Do you have a place and a time? where you stand before the Lord, where you say, Lord, here I am. Listen to these words of David. David says this in Psalm 57, 8. Awake, my glory. Awake, harp and lyre. I will awake in the dawn. What is he saying? I'm going to be worshiping even before the sun comes up. Psalm chapter 5, verse 3. In the morning, O Lord, thou wilt hear my voice. In the morning I will order my prayer to thee and eagerly watch. David was saying, every morning I'm going to let God hear my voice. And then the rest of the day I'm going to be watching for what God does. In the morning, Lord, you're going to hear my voice. Psalm 119, 147, I will rise before dawn and cry for help. I, I wait for your words. All the rest of the day, David was saying, I got up early in the morning, I cried out to God, I worship God, and then I watched throughout the day what God was doing. And I listened for God to speak to me. I know it's simple. You might say, man, I went to church today, and the only thing the guy said was he told me to get up early and pray. You know what? If you'll get up early and pray, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. One author put it this way. The, the, the progression of prayer must go through these stages. It has to go from desire to discipline before it gets to delight. You have to desire to pray, and then you have to discipline yourself to pray, and you do that long enough, and prayer will become a delight. 
We want to jump right from desire to delight and leave out the discipline. And the Bible says, exercise yourself unto godliness. Well, I don't know how to pray. We'll start putting in the time. You'll learn. Just talk to God. Tell Him what's on your heart. Pray for others. Read the Bible and learn how they prayed. I don't think it has to be all that difficult. I don't think it has to be all that, all that uh, complicated. Here's number two, discipline. If you want to be devoted. If you want to be godly, then it starts with devotion. Prayer every day, every morning. Pray. It, it, it might be 8 o'clock in the morning for you. It might be uh, 5 o'clock in the morning for somebody. It doesn't matter, but do the most important thing first. So that if nothing else goes right during that day, you know you've prayed. You know God heard your voice. You know that your wife, your children, I'm always speaking from the male perspective, but apply it to yours. You know that your wife, your children, your grandchildren had their names mentioned before Almighty God, no matter what happened that day. That God Almighty heard from someone else's lips the name of your wife and the name of your children and the name of your grandchildren. Those words, those names were brought before Almighty God, no matter what happens during their day. They've been prayed for. And it's you that's, you that's done it. That's a huge step toward being godly. Just do it. And, and, and here's number two. I know you're going to guess what this one is. Daily reading of the Bible. Read the Bible. I mean, I, I, you don't even have to understand it. Just read it. Just read it. So, oh, man, I, I, I was having this yearly devotion, and I got to Leviticus, and I quit. And just read it. You don't have to understand everything Leviticus is teaching. And, and, and I guess it's okay. You get that long list of names. Speed read. But read. Daily. Look at, look at what he says to, to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, Be diligent to present yourself approved unto God as a, walk, a watchman, a workman, rather, who does not need to be ashamed, handling accurately the word of truth. In other words, he says, Every day, be diligent. There's a diligence here. Bring yourself to God and handle his word. Bring yourself to God and handle His Word. We already read it in our text, chapter 4, verse 6. He said to nourish, constantly nourished on the words of faith. We need to learn how to nourish ourselves in the Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, All Scripture is inspired by God and, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. You interact with the Bible every day, and you know what? Faith is going to grow in your heart. Wisdom is going to grow in your heart. All kinds of good things. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 that the Bible is the Word of God, not the Word of man, and it will work effectually in those who believe. So you put the Word of God in your mind and say, okay, God, let it work. You do that every day. Exercise yourself in the godliness. Whether you understand it or not, whether you've just had a time of prayer where, the, where you were coming in and out of sleep and it's the most boring time you've had along, you, you're doing it. You must go from desire through discipline to get to delight. Exercise yourself unto godliness. Job said, I esteem the words of God more than my necessary food. Jesus put it this way, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This must be what we need to nourish ourselves. In Acts chapter 17, we are told there was a church that was more noble because they daily searched the Scriptures. Daily looking through the Scriptures. I'll tell you how, how important this was to Paul. And Again, one of these passages so easy just to breeze right over. 2 Timothy 4.13. Paul is in prison. He knows he's not getting out. He's, he's, he's saying, my time is now. I'm, I'm going to die. The time of my departure is at hand. I've run my race. I've finished my course. But you know what he says? Timothy, come here in a hurry. Get here as quickly as you can and bring the books. Bring the parchments, especially the parchments. Why? You're dying. You're never going to lead another Bible study. You're never going to preach another sermon. You know you said yourself under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You're not getting out of that jail. Why? He wanted to nourish his soul because he was godly. And that's the attitude we must have. I don't just read the Bible so that I can teach a Bible study or give a lesson. No, I read the Bible to read it. I read the Bible to nourish my soul. I read the Bible because that's what a godly person does. And if you want to be godly, you have to do what godly people do. And so, it's simple, isn't it? Just 
just read the word. And, and we say, well, I, I don't have time. There's a man by the name of Nelson Bell. I don't know how many have ever heard of Nelson Bell. He was a great missionary. He founded a hospital in China, 400 beds. And because it was a missionary hospital, he didn't have a lot of help. He didn't have a large staff. Oftentimes, he was the only guy there. But Nelson Bell would, would get out of bed every morning at 4.30 and spend the first two hours of every day reading the Bible, sometimes three. And, that was, and, and he was known to be a man of incredible faith, incredible wisdom. Despite all his administrative tasks and all he had to do running a 400-bed hospital on a very slim staff, on missionary budget, he had a son named Charles that became a great preacher. He had a daughter named Ruth that she married an evangelist named Billy Graham. You've heard that one, haven't you? Billy Graham, Ruth Graham Bell. This was her dad. And her classmates at Wheaton College said that she would rise every morning at 4.30 just to read the word. Is it any coincidence that a man like Nelson Bell has a heritage like he has? When he, when he would nurture himself and nourish himself in the word of God, and he did it every day despite having an incredibly hectic schedule. You see, we all have the same amount of time. You say, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to No, you do. We just sleep that time away. Get up early and do it. Make it the first part of your day, whatever time that is. You don't need to hear Jay Leno every night. And by the way, if you haven't picked up on this, Fox News repeats the same stuff over and over. You only need to hear it once. You don't need to be up till all hours of the night just consuming, oh, I'm tired, I need to... No, if you're tired, go to bed. Get up in the morning. Be with God. Your great-grandchildren will benefit. Your great-grandchildren will be impacted by the time you drag yourself out of bed and just do it. Just be a man, a woman of God by exercising yourself under godliness, and it's something all of us can do. All of us can do it. If Nelson Bell could do it, you can do it. If, if Lieutenant General uh, William K. Harrison could do it, you can do it. This uh, General Harrison, in, in World War II, he was the first guy to enter Belgium. He was, uh, Eisenhower said he was the best general he had, and, and even he made him chief of staff of the Korean War. He's one of the few generals who was actually wounded in battle in World War II. He received every decoration of valor except the Congressional Medal of Honor. He received the Distinguished Service Cross, the Silver Star, the Bronze Star, the Purple Heart. But you know what he did? He made it a, a program where he would read through the New Testament four times every year and the Old Testament one time every year. He started when he was 20 years old and he did it faithfully every year until he was 90 years old. He did it for 70 years. And even when he was the head of the infantry, even when he was this great military leader with all of the responsibilities, he still did it. No wonder he was known as a man of exceptional wisdom and faith and integrity. Do you realize that when he, when he stopped reading, and he couldn't read anymore because he went blind at 90. It's the only thing that stopped him from reading was he didn't have his eyes anymore. He could still listen, but he couldn't read he had read the Old Testament 70 times and the New Testament 280 times. Wow. My dear friend Curran Thomas would make it his habit to read the Bible through five times every year for 60 years. Think of the knowledge. No wonder there's still books all around India that he wrote about theology and the Bible and the ministry. It just flowed out of him. People, we can, do, we can become men of God that will impact our life and future generations by doing just a couple of simple things. Exercising yourself unto godliness. These are things you do daily. And the last thing, and I have to close with this, this is something to do weekly, and it's, it's pretty important. You're already doing it. Re regularly gather. We're living in an age that seems to want to throw away the church and replace the church and think it's not important to gather. It's important to gather. Nothing will ever take the place of believers gathering together. No technology, uh, computers, books, online, none of that, all of that supplement. Nothing will ever replace gathering together. That's the way God set it up. And he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, 15. He said, I'm writing you so that you'll learn how and you'll know how and you'll be able to teach people how to behave in the house of God. 
See, the church is the house of God, and we need to be a part of the house of God. And, and, and that's where the, the word is expounded upon, and, and we worship God, and we pray together. You read the book of Acts, we say, why don't we have the miracles and the power they had in the book of Acts? We have more knowledge than they ever had. Oh, we don't pray like they prayed. You read the book of Acts, they're constantly gathering in homes and in other places, courtyards of the temple, just to pray, just to seek God until the power would fall. We need to be people who gather. And we gather to pray. We gather to, to, to hold each other accountable, to encourage one another. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 and 25 says, Stimulate one another to love and good works. Do not forsake the gathering together as the manner of some is. We, we read in, in Psalms 84, 4, it says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. I mean, blessed are those that, that they dwell there. They don't just visit occasionally. They dwell there. It's their life. Even in their old age, they're going to be praising God. They're going to still be hanging in there, blessing God, praising God. The Bible says, Psalm 122, 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the house of the Lord. And it's something you delight in getting together with other believers, worshiping together, praying together, seeing people, hey, how you doing? One of the reasons we put the Bible reading plan in the, in the bulletin, I encourage you to read that. Bible reading plan. Wouldn't it be great if we could, we could stimulate one another? When you see each other somewhere, hey, what did you read this morning? Did you read those chapters? And you'd be reading the same ones. Encouraging one another, stimulating one another to love and good works and being that dwelling place of God's Spirit and presence as we, as we gather together and we don't forsake the assembling together of ourselves. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 6 and 7 that, that as, as we walk in the light, we will have fellowship one with another. It's pretty basic, people. If we don't pray every day, if we don't read every day, if we don't gather every week, we're not going to be godly. So if we want to be godly, we can all do it. Make it a priority of your life. And I, I, you know, I, I, I think there's so many excuses. I make excuses myself. We've got to say, wait a minute. If I'm going to be a man of God, I have to eliminate all excuses. I have to strip off things that would encumber me exercising myself in godliness. What does that mean to you? How does, it, how does it change your schedule? What do you have to do to pull this off? You can do it. I don't have time for points two and three. We'll, we'll eventually come to these pass, uh, passages, but we need to be growing in generosity. We need to be growing in ministry. But today, and, and Connie, if you would come, and musicians, if you'd come, as we'd get, get ready to close this service, listen to Malachi 3.16. It says, then those who fear the Lord, what is that? That's godly, the, the godly ones. Then those who fear the Lord spoke to one another. And the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and those who meditate on his name. In other words, there were people that feared the Lord, so they would get together and they would, they would encourage each other. And the Lord took note of it. The Lord even wrote a book of remembrance, and he knew those that truly feared his name, those that were godly. You know, I don't know how many years you have left. I don't know how many years I have left. There might be some of us in this room that have many, many years left. There might be all of us in this room that have one year left. We don't know what the future is. But every one of us can start right now exercising ourselves unto godliness. That no matter what else happens in life, we will be godly. That no matter what else happens in each day that we live from here on out, we will begin that day in the presence of God. We will begin that day as, 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 as fleshly as sometimes we will seem and as, as uninspired as sometimes it will feel, we will do it. Because that's what godly people do. And if I want the right results, I've got to do the right thing. Devotion. Would you stand together and let's just offer ourselves one more time to God. If you're here today or you're listening to this message and you don't know Jesus Christ, then you haven't even gotten to the beginning point. <laughs> the starting point is to receive the forgiveness of Jesus and allow Him to cleanse us from our sin and put us in right standing with God. You see, it's the blood of Jesus that opens the doorway for us to come into God's presence. Our sin kept us out, but Jesus paid the price for our sin so that every day we could know God. Hallelujah. You know... Lorraine and I started getting back in the habit of doing something that I just really enjoy. We've gotten out of the habit of it. 
last few years. Last, this past year, we've gotten back in the habit, and that is we try every day to eat a meal together. Isn't that sad when married people have to try to eat a meal together? Because she's going there, and I'm going here, and we're all over the place, and we're rushing. And No, but I mean, I mean to sit down and take an hour and just sit there. Just be together. And sometimes we talk a lot. And sometimes we don't hardly say anything. But it's become one of my favorite times of the day. Just sit there together. I even try cooking some. Dogs like it. But we're just together. Is it always inspiring? Does she always look across the table at me and say, oh, he's so beautiful, he's so handsome? <laughs> Only if I turn the lights down really low. I bet you once in a while she feels like that. I feel like that toward her. Well, whether you're feeling that way at that moment or not, you're doing it. You're together. Shouldn't it be that way with the Lord? There are times we feel his presence. We just say, oh, God, you're so good. You know, the tears flow, the goosebumps rise. We feel his presence. God, you're so good. But let me tell you something. When you're fighting the sleep bug and you're just trying to get through your devotion, he's still just as good. Do it. Give him that time every day. Your life will never be the same. You'll get to the point where you might even wake up before your alarm or your alarm will go off and say, hey, I get to get up. This is time. I get to get up. I get to be with him. Hallelujah. And I don't want to put you on a guilt trip about how he's waiting for you, but you know what? Keep that in mind. He delights when you spend time with him. You say amen, and you rush off to start your day, and I can't help but think the Lord just looks down and says, that was good. I enjoyed that. And then you listen for him the rest of the day. David said, I'm gonna, God's going to hear my voice before the sun comes up, and then I'm going to wait on him the rest of the day. You know what? If God will hear your voice in the morning, you just might hear his voice during the day. Let's be godly. So as we close in song and Pastor Lloyd will close us in prayer, make a commitment today.